I mean, it's so easy to get in front of yourself, which is what makes tonight and every time we do this when somebody gives their testimony, because it's not about self. It's about stepping behind that cross and showing what God's done, right? And that's what we glorify through all this, because our rescue was not because of our own selves. <laughs> and I don't care where you've came from, the rescue is the same for all of us. Tonight is, uh, tonight, I mean, tonight's real special to me and my family. Um, James has been a part of our lives in multiple different ways. Um, don't, James. Um, but I, uh, I found a brother a long time ago in James, and I've watched him through his walk. And now, listen, when you get called and you're saved and, and Jesus makes his rescue, his rescue is perfect. But we're imperfect. And there's a lot of imperfections in our walk and in our process, right? Who out here is, uh, claims to be a Christian and saved by the Lord Jesus Christ? Raise your hands. And who has messed that up today? <laughs> right? How many? Right, exactly. How many times? So remember that when you, when you have these testimonies, you're going to have haters, right? And we're, we're, we're told that there's going to be people against us. It's absolutely, it's almost a necessity for it to happen, right? Because that makes it more of, it's not about James. This is all about what God has done, man. And the appointments that he set up in his life and, and where he's at today. And for all of us. Um, so I, I, won't, I won't hold up very long. Thank you for the worship. Give him another hand, uh, hand clap, man. That was, you guys are... The Lord has just blessed you, and we're blessed to be in your presence and, and worship with you guys. That was awesome, and uh, thank you for your prayer. Uh, that was just on point, and I'm not going to hold up any longer. James, if you want to come up here and uh, take the mic, or you have your own mic, actually. You're all a secret agent. <laughs> all right, I got a green light, so. So we, we do ours a little differently. Um, after the testimony, after he speaks or whatever, we are going to open it up for everybody out here to ask a question. Oh, Lord. Yep. <laughs> I didn't tell James about that one. Whoa. That doesn't be interested. Yeah. Um, no, but it, it's good to, um, Help me. to have some interaction. And, um, you know, we can, we can give our, our, our testimony, but there's a lot of people in here that are got some things that they're going to grab out of this. They're going to be like, but what does that mean like in my life? Mm. Or what does that mean for my family? Or what does that restoration look like for, for others? Like, what does your ministry look like? How do I do my, how, where do I start? So you feel free at the end of it when we come back up here to ask James uh, whatever you want, please. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm cool yeah, with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I think in line with that, God, I used to tell people when I worked at the rescue mission, like God gave me a life of no separation. So when I came to the Lord, he really just showed me that like it was okay to just be me, to just be like the real me, the vulnerable me. And he said, James, look, check it out. Like, have you seen the newspaper articles about yourself? Let's check the court docket today, James. Like you were out there, bro. <laughs> so if you're like going to be ashamed of the gospel, we might as well just nip this thing in the bud right now. Right. The problem is that we live in a society where we get like rock star mentality or like movie star mentality or idol mentality or I cannot stand that show American Idol because like we really idolize people. And then it becomes the person. So when the person lets us down, then our whole world is shattered. But there's one person who never let us down and the world's not talking about him. His name is Jesus. I know this because I used to stand on Jeff and Andrew's front porch and Jeff would like calmly bring up Jesus because he knew I was hostile to the gospel and he really knew my vehement hatred towards God and I hate to admit that today but it's a very real story I used to flip off the sky and like cuss God I was one of those people that like yes I, I started with in a myriad of bad circumstances in life like my dad was an African-American and my mom was white and they decided to move me to a highly racist um, county which you know the 
you, you, do, you do the best you can with what you got. And I didn't understand that until I got older. But nonetheless, I grew up with people that like to call me nigger all the time. And like it was real weird to me because I'd never even really met an African-American person in my life. Right. So I didn't even know what that meant other than I knew they didn't like me. And even at home, I grew up different because I was like, I would tan in the summertime and the rest of my family turned red, peeled, and went right back to notebook white. Amen? <laughs> and I was like, I'm different. Yeah, I'm different. I'm different. So I was a little bit different. I, I had an attitude problem, some, some stuff. I was cool as a real little kid, I remember. Did, I was like a little weirdo. I was always in trouble, like making my mom mad. And my sister was six years older, and she was like golden child, photographic memory, recite the entire universe in two seconds, and <laughs> farted rainbows, was never in trouble. Like, I did not like her. But she was my homie for real because she would, she would look out for me when my mom was not around or when my mom was asleep, which was all the time. Not sleeping all the time, but she had to sleep because she worked, went to college, and slept, right? So you got to sleep, Amen. So my sister would look out, and I, I grew to love her even after all the violence and the stuff I ensued and incited in her, amen? Don't, don't cause strife with your siblings. You might get beat up, amen, by a girl. She was six years older than me, amen? I'm sticking with that. Anyway, so I grew up in this, like this house, and my grandma and grandpa, very cool people. My grandpa, like, he was a heathen in his younger days. He had come to the Lord. He was like now becoming a minister, like super solid guy, real straightforward, like a man's man. He would sit down to watch the show Gunsmoke and hair would puff out of his work t-shirt. And I just thought, that's cool. That's grandpa. You know what I mean? So I thought that was deep. And grandpa was my hero. And so I was, a I, was, I was a bad kid. My aunt Sharon will tell you I was all right, but I was a bad kid. I caused a lot of trouble. I willfully did that stuff. I knew I was doing wrong. I knew I was going to get the slap, paddle, slapped again, and paddled some more. Amen. And th probably thrown in my room for a whole night, grounded as the day was long. And I was like, let's do it. <laughs> let's go. I was motivated for iniquity from a very young age. Some stuff happened to me when I was real young. I got molested by a, a, a family member, which threw some chaos into the game. Like I, was, I knew I was different. I knew I wasn't as smart as my cousins or my sister. I knew I couldn't perform. I knew I was always in trouble. And as much as I really wanted to get right, I couldn't get right. And then being molested made me really feel like a weirdo. Amen. I just, I wasn't like okay with being who I was anymore because I didn't know what that meant in the eyes of other people. Amen. And even today, sometimes that, that very beginning tries to cry, cry out and define my, my now, right? So I have performance issues. Sometimes I feel like I got to perform instead of just resting in the promise of who he says I am. And how many of you know that his promises are true, but I don't always live in the promise? Yeah, yeah. Amen. I'll talk about it. I'll be real cool about it. That's why I like platforms like this, because we can just get real with each other, right? But, like, let's just testify to some wrong stuff I got on. Amen. I was taking the, I was outside this morning. Where was I at? My wife's like, when was the last time you read your Bible? I read my Bible every day. I preach that. My wife told me, practice what you preach. So I read my Bible. I'm getting jazzy in the yard, bro. You feel me? You know how I am, Travis. I'm jazzy through the window. Cage courage. You know what I mean? I read my Bible. What? 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 And she's like, you want me to check it? I said, get on you version right now and check it. She said, mine says it says three days ago. And I was like, I said, are you serious? I was like, no, nah, I read that. I was like, I don't even know why. It must be because, like, if you just read the, the verse of the day, it don't click you off on the little numbers. That's what it was. But in an instant, I thought, man, that's crazy because, like, three days. Joseph and Mary lost Jesus. It took them three days to get him back, and it happens. Why? Because we get the job. We get the blessings from the Lord. He elevates our life. He brings us into a new position despite who we are. We don't really deserve to be where we're at. And then we glory in the blessing, and the blessing becomes an idol, and then it becomes a trap. And you say, well, James, it came from God. It's good, right? God created the whole earth. Everything came from God. <laughs> That's a mute point, amen? We get stuck on some stuff. <laughs> I got a job at Iowa, and I'm cool. <laughs> you know, I do nothing else. I'm just cool, just like this. <laughs> I ain't reading my Bible. I ain't saying a prayer. You feel me? This is like real talk. This is like, I don't know if what you thought when you heard James McKinney. I know what probably a couple of you thought. I mean, but we don't talk about that. Uh, but we get in this system, in this routine, and especially in our county, and I'm talking about Grant County, to all my friends and homies from over there in Marion. 
that there's this rock star idolism in recovery, and really it's Jesus who is the man, right? So vulnerability. So like vulnerability and transparency sometimes, I'm not hating on anybody, so I don't want nobody to take it that way, but we, get, we have to uphold an image all of a sudden. But I mean, you can go to any church in the United States of America and see a whole bunch of images being lifted high. <laughs> When really they ought to set that stuff down and be like, I exalt thee. Because in spite of us, he still loves us and is calling us into better things. And sometimes he'll take you to a better thing when you don't belong there to show you how much he's trying to tell you. You really ought to listen way back here. I'm going to bless you, son. But when you wake up and you realize you don't belong here, now that you don't belong, I brought you here and I'll sustain you. But maybe you need to do some work. Amen. Because if you sit around or you wake up and you think recovery, a better lifestyle, a better life, a better way of thinking, a better outfit's just going to land in your lap, if it does, bless you, but that's not a consistent reality. There's no time for weakness. There's no time for holding on to, hiding, turning, hanging on to anything that is setting us back. How many of you feel like you made it? <laughs> right. <laughs> Seriously. And if you do feel like you made it, God help you. Because the last time I checked, nobody jumped up out of a casket when I walked past the funeral home. <laughs> Amen. I walked past some sick people that was coughing, was still coughing when my presence went away. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And really, if you're doing all that, we're still sketched out because Jesus said, I don't know you. Man, what Cam says, that's, that's fire, bro. What you said about like, what do we put before Jesus? Like, did I consult Jesus for my next breath? Did I consult Jesus for my next cigarette? Did I consult Jesus for my next conversation, phone call, job duty? Whatever it is, when you wake up, did you consult the Lord? Because I promise you one of two things is going to happen when you finally see the Lord. Amen? You're either going to be like, hey, Jesus, I'm here. And he's going to be like, yeah, bro, you made it. Or you're going to automatically know you don't fit in. Because we can talk about the kingdom. We can fake the kingdom. You can fake the kingdom. We can do all that, but what we can't do is come in if we don't belong. One of the things when I was little, my mom used to say that I was so black and white. <laughs> Drove me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> I'm telling you, yes. She's like, you're so black and white. I was like, mm hmm Not my fault. Some clear, definable realities in life. And that one was your fault. <laughs> I ain't mad at you, but it's your fault. Amen. What my mom meant was that I don't have a gray area. There's no in between. We're either going to go hard or we ain't going to go at all. And if we ain't going to go at all, ask my wife. We ain't doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? We ain't finna do it. We ain't doing it. And then I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep it real. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. She said there's no gray area in your life. And I promise you, it's one of the indicators in my life that now I see that God has been with me and sustaining me my whole life because he's trying to tell us as Christians, as followers of the way, as people sold out for Jesus, there's no gray area. You are either with me or you are against me. The very word Satan breaks down in Hebrew to the word shayetan. Shaitan means an opposing force. So anything that is not of God is against God. It's real easy. He made it easy for us. And we're like, well, I'm complicated. Stop. You know what I mean? You're just being weird. <laughs> yeah, you're just being weird. <laughs> let, me, let me make wise 20s. Listen, I just got out of algebra class. Praise the Lord. I made it alive. <laughs> Our pastor, this, this is cool. Because I was talking to Travis, he, he called me, and precious dude, I love this dude so much, but he called me, and he just came to lift me up and check in on me, and I told him, I said, Travis, man, ever since like a week ago, I was coming home from work, and I was just, I was just really grateful, right? I just, I found myself in a, in a place of gratitude, and I'll, I'm going to tell you about some victories the Lord has won in my life, and it's cool stuff because I was homeless for years and years and years. Asked Jeff and Andrew. I had really no place to lay my head. And when I did, it was a real awkward situation. And I was a loser in it, right? I was really mistreating some people and doing them bad. And it was just a wrong thing. 
So I never really had a place to call my own, and God blessed me with a home. And I've never really had a car of my own, and God blessed me with a car and and an actual legal license so I could drive. Thank God, honey. He kind of did you hear that? He blessed me with a job at IWU, and I I don't even deserve my job. Like, I have no idea how I got in there. I got so many traffic violations in Huntington for no license. Amen. That's why I said that. Um, I just, uh, like, I did my interview to get into the HVAC department, and this this is how God moves in your life when he says go, right? Months before I was doing the Easter pageant, and I know a guy named Eric Richards, and uh, we were chopping it up at Easter pageant practice, and I just heard the Lord say, ask Brent for a job. Let me tell you who Brent is. Brent is my wife's cousin. This dude is like everybody's dad, and he's so freaking nice. Like, he's the nicest dude you could ever meet in your life, and he knows how to fix literally everything. So when stuff breaks at my house, since I used to shoot dope and kick in doors and Rob folks, like I wasn't building nothing but an empire of evil, amen? <laughs> and that ain't got nothing to do with nuts and bolts. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so I call Brent. Brent, bro, since it's broke, will you help me? Yes, I'm coming, all right? So the Holy Spirit says, ask Brent for a job. And I was like, Lord, this is nuts. Because <laughs> Brent has this dad look. He gives you one of your nuts. You know what I mean? He's, yeah, I know that one. Like, I care about you, but you need to quit real quick. Amen? <laughs> I thought that was the look I was going to get, and so... I'd kind of prayed about it and argued with the Lord. Don't look at me weird. You argue with Jesus every day. I know you do. And I forgot. And church came and we're sitting there chopping it up, talking to the piano player. And Brent walks in with his wife. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I didn't want to miss the moment, right? Because I thought this was going to get real fun. And if you know me, you know I like to stop. So I was like, I'm going to stir the pot with Brent here. So he sits down like, Brent, I don't want to hedge the bet, and I know this is going to be real weird, but I felt like the Holy Spirit asked me to ask you for a job. Instantly, him and his wife start crying. And me and my wife are like, what is going on? Like, this dude don't cry, bro. He's like everybody's dad, you know what I mean? He shared some stuff with me that's not mine to share, but he said, I would love to do that for you, James. So he got me on as this little student worker because I'm in school, praise God. So I started a summer temp job and with the hope to get a full-time job. And so a full-time job opened up an HVAC. It's changing filters. I don't even know what HVAC stands for to this day. I think it's heating, vacations, acclimations, cool stuff. <laughs> Amen. So I go into the interview, right? And I sit down in front of these dudes that have been working at IWU for about 30 some years, amen. And they're talking to me and they got to know me over the like if you know me, like if you have met me and spent like even an hour and a half with me, you pretty much know who I am. I'm a hundred percent, I'm a weirdo, but I love Jesus, amen. amen. <laughs> and we're gonna sing songs out of tune and love God for it. The Bible says, my Bible says, make a joyful noise, amen. So I'll make a joyful noise, amen. <laughs> we're gonna sing, we're gonna talk about Jesus, and then we're gonna talk about where we're really at with Christ, amen. And we're going to admit our faults and our failures and our hang-ups and our bad habits so we can get that stuff off of us because Paul said, I glory in my weakness. Why? Because in spite of my weakness, he'll use me. And when I claim my weakness, he is mighty to save me from those things. But as long as I say I'm cool or I'm good or I'm doing okay or it's all good, bro. Like, miss me with that. We're not all good because people aren't jumping out of caskets, being healed, getting sober, Right? All these empty seats, man, that's encouragement for each and every one of us to share our testimony. You think, well, I don't know how to talk to folks. Yeah, you do. You talk to the dope dealer. You talk to the girl, the dude you wanted to date. You hook them. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus just says, speak your truth. You little weirdo, I'll work the rest of it out. You know what I mean? You ain't got to do all that trifling stuff you had to do before. I mean, I'll spare you from all that. I'll part the waters of that weird stuff so you just walk through and be like, Hi, Jesus saved my life. <laughs> life of no separation. You know what I mean? I don't even really know where I'm at. I'm just thankful to God today. Amen. Oh, yeah, the interview in the HVAC department. So they asked me, they're like, James, we kind of know you. Over the summer, we see that you're willing to work hard, that you'll learn, that you really try real good. And I told him, I said, look, man, this is the deal. Like, I screwed off 36 years of my life. I wound up at a rescue mission staring at the wall one day, and I thought, man, I really, like, I really mean it. Like, I want to get sober. 
but I can't. I've tried. I've been to AA. I've been to NA since I was 16. Bam. <laughs> I worked a program. I counted steps. <laughs> Did some 13 stepping every now and then. <laughs> I was sick. Amen. Look at my face. Sorry. I was sick, and I told him, I said, listen, I just want to try. And I said, I'm like a little baby. You know what I mean? Like, Jesus came into my life. I was in a meth-induced psychosis. The voices started to die down. I was in that thing for about seven months. Stuff got real weird. We don't have time to unpack all that stuff, but you don't ever want to get there. Amen? I heard voices so loud that we wouldn't be able to have a conversation with each other. I heard voices that would attach to every relationship, every thought that come across the screen. They would jump on it and tear it apart. <laughs> oh, that was my friend. No, they weren't. <laughs> And then they would remind me of all the crappy stuff I'd done, all the shame and the guilt, and they'd just dump it and dump it. And you know, you think to like eighty to 100,000 thoughts a day. So when you got the demons in you, when you got Legion in there with all his little buddies jumping on everything, saying what they got to say, and I promise you those dudes are real, and they manifest, they are audible, and they are there. Amen? So the voices started to die down. I wasn't on methamphetamine, praise God. I was at the Grant County Rescue Mission. The place saved my life. Amen. Put me in a position to really receive Jesus. And I was staring at the wall, and I said, I really mean it. I really want to get sober. I don't know how. I'm 36, and even if I did get sober, I'm 36. I got no job experience, no job training. All I can do is run my mouth. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and most of the time, get beat up for it. <laughs> praise God. <laughs> it's funny. I still run my mouth, and people beat me up for it sometimes. <laughs> Not physically, because I'm just too old. <laughs> they know that'd whoop me real quick, and it wouldn't be a fight, amen? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I was desperate. And it would have been real easy to stand and look at the sea that was still murky and a bunch of unknowns. That's what the sea means to ancient people in the Bible, in case you ever read the Bible and see that they came up to a sea or a river. It just means the murky unknown, that's what it translates down to, though they came to a very physical, real sea. You can't see to the bottom of the ocean. It's a little sketchy, okay? The connection is not too far apart. Praise God. So I was standing at the sea of possible sobriety, and I didn't know if I was going to make it, and it would have been real comfortable to go roll back right to Pharaoh and his ways of doing things. Amen? And God knows. He knows where you're at. He knows you're standing at the edge of the sea. He leads you out. I don't know why you came tonight, but I know who brought you here. Because when we lift the name of God high, he draws people unto himself. And that's why it's weird when people take this position and think they did anything. Yeah. Praise God. We just lift the name of God high. Amen. Amen. We exalt Jesus. Why? Because he draws men to himself. Because when the spirit that lives in me speaks yeah. to you, it speaks to the spirit that lives in you that draws men unto himself. Because it's him living in us. To unite us together to be a body of Christ. I was standing on the sea of indecision. It would have been real easy to run back. But I didn't want to run back. Because for the first time in my life, I was truly sorry. I was truly sorry for all the wrong, for all the wrong relationships, for all the drugs, for all the hurt, for all the harm, for all the neglect, for all the abuse, for all the hatred, for all the anger, for all the animosity, for all the lies, for all the deceit, for all the brokenness, for all the sorrow, for all the emptiness, for all the left out. I was sorry and I knew I couldn't change it on my own and I didn't want to cry out to God. I didn't want to do it. Because if you ask Jeff and Andrew, I've been against Jesus for so long. And it was like the last, it was like the last little. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't even asking me to take a full step. He was just asking me to cry out, James. But I wouldn't do it because of my pride and my vainness and my weirdness. But thank God for demonic possession because it really put me in a place where I couldn't even remember who I was to stand on it anymore. <laughs> I'm being straight up. Satan had ripped apart everything that made up my ego and my personality and my past and my future and my history and what I thought I could stand on and who I thought I was. He ripped it down to little tiny pieces and smushed it and smashed it because I'd given my whole life to him and he owned it wholly. That's why I heard the voices because I gave over full possession of my life to the one who never cared about me and he started ripping my life away. I was up on the third floor of the mission and the dude was talking about some story in the Bible. I don't know what it was specifically. Don't hate me for that. 
But I said, I think that's in Isaiah 1.1. And if you go to Isaiah 1.1, I'm not going to preach out of there because Jeff and Andrew told me not to preach, but I'm a preacher, so it's weird. Um, but I'm not going to preach out of there. But the story goes something like this. The children of Israel went their own way. They refused to come back to God. So now they walked around with these open sores that would not heal putrefying sores. And it was so strange to me because for five and a half years, I've been running around with a sore on my leg this big, like huge. And it smelled like a dead rat in the hot July sun for seven weeks. I mean, I'm talking about, I'd be like, what's that smell? I'm like, oh, it's my leg. Oh, it's gross. So I'd pour like rubbing alcohol on it. I think I poured bleach in it once. The most terrible idea I ever had. I was a weirdo and I was strung out on drugs. I wasn't thinking properly, folks. Don't you laugh at me, amen? <laughs> Just think about some weird stuff you did. If you really own it, you ain't got no right to laugh at me no more. Praise God. I'm up here being vulnerable trying to show you the way. Praise God. Pass this bucket. <laughs> That's why they told me not to preach, amen? Anyway, it said that they'd just gone their own way and they'd done their own thing and they'd, they'd just their transgressions and their iniquity and it just became who they were. It just it had possessed them and they thought that's who they really were. So they walked around in it and they couldn't tell. And this is weird because they're like Israelite people. They'd walked through the ocean. They'd been at the, t the, the tent of meeting. They'd seen the temple every day. They'd seen their relatives offer sacrifices. But man, they'd just gone the wrong way. And after all, he said all that. He said, if you just... Man, if you just come back, I'm not mad at you. I'm any ill will for you. You walked into that thing, the thing that I tried to shelter you from and guide you out of. Because you see, I was raised in church. My grandpa was a minister. He had spoken the word of life into me, but I rejected it thoroughly just like they had. And now I was living in the consequences and like a big, fat moron, I'm mad at God. God, this is your fault. <laughs> Look at this mother you gave me, God. <laughs> Never knowing that he really loved my mother too. <laughs> you talk about a hard thing to reconcile yourself to. When the ones closest to you hurt you the most, it's often hard to remember that God loves them maybe even a little more than he loves you. <laughs> maybe his heart's a little more for them right now because if you're already back in the fold, <laughs> I mean, who doesn't? Who doesn't want somebody to know Jesus is good? That's why you can always and forever, and I give you full permission, go to any church you want to in America and look at, at all of them like they're weirdos. Because <laughs> you ain't left this church house in 30 years to go to the trap, to the mission, to the jailhouse, to the prison, to the homeless shelter. What are you doing in here at the king's table? Why don't you go out there and feed somebody else? I believe God's doing a new thing in the church, and I believe he's doing it in places like this. I know this is a church, so don't weird out on me, amen? But I believe he's trying to do it in people that understand brokenness. And I believe he's building a bond between people who understand brokenness thicker than the people who don't understand it because we know that we were saved, and it was nothing that we did ourselves. People ask me so many times, James, what did you do? Nothing, you moron. I encountered Jesus, and he changed my life. Yeah. Like what he says, not my cell phone, but in the Bible that's in my cell phone, is true. <laughs> Amen. Well, you got to clarify stuff with people. You know what I mean? They'll repeat this stuff. You know how many times my wife has recorded something and somebody be like, what do you mean by what you said in that video your wife posted on the book of the faces? What was that? I don't even know what you're talking about, brothers. Yesterday I used to smoke crystal meth. My brain is fried, son. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. If it took you four seconds to figure that out, that's sad, buddy. Hey, listen, though. So I was, I was desperate. I didn't want to cry out to God. Amen. I really didn't want to do it. I was like, man, now, now like, so the only thing that I really remembered that was solid about my old self was I didn't like Jesus. And I found myself in the rescue mission, and they talk about Jesus a lot there. Praise God. 
Seriously, praise God. I mean, they'll drown you with that thing. Praise God. And like, it's cool. You can go in there and be like, oh, they work here. They got to talk about Jesus because that whole $9.50 an hour really motivates them to speak the name of Jesus and get cussed at 24-7. No, it doesn't. But when other people from the streets come in and talk about the same Jesus, the same healing power, the same resurrection, and the same purpose in your life, you start to wonder like, man. And it comes from people that are like, look, bro, I suck. And unless Jesus comes and motivates my life, I'm nothing. And I can do nothing. And it's empty and vain. And I promise you, if Jesus didn't leave me here, I wouldn't be here. Amen. Praise God. We just talked about it. Nobody's going to prisons. Nobody's going to the homeless shelters. Nobody's going to the trap house. When was the last time you went to the trap house porch? Just be like, bro, remember when I used to buy dope off of you? Yeah, it was cool. I appreciate you looking out, man. I love you, bro. And I want you to know that I changed my life. And that Jesus is real. And you can laugh at me or be weird, but I just came by to say what's up. Check on you. Love you. You might think that's weird. There's a grandmother. She asked me to go talk to her little grandson. He's making bad life decisions. Amen. Me and my wife went down there to eat lunch with little Blake. And I just talked to him about like all the bad stuff I'd done, the marijuana, how it started with the marijuana. You know what I mean? Then it turned into hallucinogenics. And then it was pills it's just a vicodin script from the doctor and then it turned into bigger pills and then it turned to other exotic drugs like crystal meth and a booze was always mixed in there and then it was the girls and it was trying to fit in and you weirdo you can't fit in unless you play football you're a smart kid or you got nice clothes and you spend all your money on drugs and you didn't show up to practice amen because you were lit <laughs> so like how cool are you gonna be bro amen and I just shared with him, like, broken relationships with my family, right? Like, my mom and me were beefing my entire life. Like, my grandma and grandpa who really loved me, I didn't really get a chance to really be with them. For, like, my grandpa never seen it. Praise God, he was dead. But my grandmother, when I was younger, was alive. And she, like, didn't get to be with me, right? My aunts and uncles who had helped raise me didn't get to be with me. My cousins who were, like, my, my sisters, my best friends growing up. I was separated from them for 25 years. So we lost out on quality family time. Amen. And we left, and I came back up north, and two weeks later, his grandmother's coming down the hall of the wound care clinic. Remember, I talked about them putrefying sores. That's where I met that beautiful lady. She healed me, and then she saved me in a lot of ways. Amen. <laughs> Praise God, I'm only here today because of the Lord and her. I mean that. I mean that. If I, it wasn't for my wife to hold me together sometimes and, and just wash me in the Word like I'm supposed to do with her, I'd probably be way more of a big mess than what I am today. Amen. <laughs> Because I'll be honest with you, while we're being transparent, I know I bounce back and forth. They, they call it ADHD. I just like to cover a lot of topics. Amen? <laughs> I'm utilizing Cam's strategy. We're going to think in the positive. Praise God. <laughs> Never mind. I don't even know what I was talking about. We came back up north. <laughs> and Karen comes walking down the hallway. She works with my wife. And she said, I want you to know, Blake called me. And she, he asked me something funny. And I said, oh, yeah, what, what was it? He said, who was that pastor that you brought down, and I, listen, God help me, I never mentioned the name of Jesus one time talking to that kid. I just hung out with him like he's my little brother, and I cared about him a whole lot, and knew there was a better life meant for that young man. His mom's a cop with a drug dog. I said, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I said, she don't need a search warrant, son, she owns the house. <laughs> Shoo! But you see, in the tenure at the rescue mission and working there and coming into contact with some different pastors who said, James, they would just hear me talk about Jesus. Amen. That's it. I would just talk about Jesus. It didn't sound like great. It wasn't like Jake's or Furtick. They would just see my, the, the thing in my eyes. Like, you guys get it. When I, when I zero in on you and I'm just like, yes, the Lord, man, can you believe? Like when he told them to get off the mat, which was the harder thing, and they're arguing about, you said this, and then pick up your mat, and this and that. The hard thing was for the guy on the mat to believe he could get off that thing and walk with it <laughs> oh yeah they told me not to preach <laughs> I shut a whole lot of pastors down that said once you once you testified about the goodness of God you remember I hated God I didn't want to cry out to God it was the one last remaining string in me of a remembrance of who I used to be. And I don't even know how it happened really except for like Brandon Chisholm just came and bore his heart one night. And he said, I just want to ask everybody, 
Because you know, like icebreakers, when people just get real and it cuts the tension in the atmosphere, now we know that we're all on some same level and there's no pedestals and nobody's above one another and we're just going to be real, real and real relatable. And he said, I just want you, I want you to tell me what you think about God. And I said, I don't know about God. And he said, that's cool, homeboy. I get it. Why don't you check out this Todd White video for me? And I was like, all right. For three weeks, he asked me. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. I never did it. And then if you know Brandon Chisholm, most of you probably do. He's bigger in the house and he's not fat. <laughs> Amen. He threatened to stuff me in a trash can. <laughs> and at the time, I was probably uh, six times smaller than what I am now. <laughs> I was like this big around. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll watch it. <laughs> So instead of trusting my word, which was untrustable, amen, he said, no, I want you to get that phone out right now. And I was like, dang, bro, you're sweating me, bro. My phone's up there. I pulled out my phone, and I looked up Todd White, and I was like, you happy? And he was like, hit play. <laughs> and then I walk away, and I hit play. For three days, I watched Todd White, and I didn't care what he was saying about Jesus. I just knew that he was in some really big churches, and people were in suit and ties, and he was saying some, like, really unchurchy stuff about pornography and cigarettes and drugs and violence and all that stuff, you know what I mean? And he was crying tears, and he meant it. You ever talk to somebody and know they mean it? Yeah. He meant it. And I said, man, Lord, if you mean anything for my life right now, I'm weirded out. But if you mean anything for my life, just speak to me. For two more days, I watched Todd White videos. And I was sitting at the front desk of the rescue mission in a broken, helpless, scared, anxious, unknowing state. 36-year-old male, never done anything constructive with my life except have some really wrong babies. I mean, babies out of wedlock and didn't raise them. <laughs> Amen. Ruined their life, neglected them their whole life, was on dope, was never a dad, never provided, never did nothing for them babies, hurt their mamas, hurt their families, hurt everybody I knew, took, 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 scared to death, unworthy of the presence of a perfect God. No one can ever take my past away from me. You know why? I praise God for it. I used to hate every second of it. And I praise God because it put me in a place where I knew I was unworthy to receive what I received on the day. He said, James, this is real, and I love you. And it melted me. He'd been trying to tell me my whole life, but sometimes we're not in positions to really listen. Because we're holding on, like when Cam was talking about emptying yourself out and being in a place where you let him clean you out. And like, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, right? Cam didn't say that's just a song, and I was repeating it because Cam sings songs and he would get it. Um, so like what it means is that we clean out this temple, this sanctuary that we are. We have let God have full reign inside our hearts and minds. And what that means, James McKinney, is that you read your Bible every day and you seek the Lord through prayer and meditation before you do anything because... What we understand as people like you and me is that we're unworthy. And listen, when Christ comes in and he starts to fill this space, what you think is you is still unworthy. He is worthy. Because if you think you're worthy at any second of that, you'll start mucking up that house again. And I did say the M-U-C-K word, muck, like dirt. And you'll start stacking stuff in there like the job. And then the cute wife, a couple vehicles, the friends, the to-dos, the bills. And all of a sudden, you'll start weighing yourself down in responsibilities. And you'll miss every gift that he's giving to you because you won't be able to see it through your own crap. Does that make sense? Bill Johnson from Redding, California. He said, anything that you gain in the pursuit of God becomes a prophetic vision for God's provision, fathership, and love for you. But anything you gain outside the pursuit of God is fully dependent on you and becomes a prophetic vision of your own self-sustenance, provision, and fathership in your own life. And what you're doing is you're fueling your own ego. So if God didn't give it to you and you got it on your own, maybe it's time to get rid of it. And I'm not talking about just material possessions. I'm talking about the belief that you'll never measure up, that you don't fit in, that you're not good enough. Amen? Because the promise has said, you didn't ever have to measure up. As a matter of fact, he spoke everything into existence. He even spoke his own son, Cam, into existence. Let there be light. And there was light. And he was the firstborn of all creation. 
and he illuminated the darkness and his spirit hovered over the chaos and brought everything. What I'm trying to tell you is God built provision and everything we would ever need before he ever stepped down and pulled the dirt up. He spoke everything else, but he got real personal with us. And you're like, well, that was Adam and Eve. No, listen, I knew you in your mother's womb. I foreknew you. Okay, so stop playing with me. I read my Bible. <laughs> I was in a sick state, and Jesus, he came in watching them Todd White videos. And this verse, as I was talking to Travis on the phone, I thought, I just, Travis, I just know that I want the Lord to speak because this matters. You matter. Amen? I don't care what anybody else has ever said to you in your life, what has ever happened to you. You matter. You matter so much that a holy, perfect God took a cross up a hill and while they whipped him and they spit on him and they beat him and they raised him up he who knew no sin became everything wrong you would ever do in your life so he could stretch out his arms and say father forgive because they don't know and I'm giving my life so that they may know and when you come into that knowledge you'll taste and you'll see of the sweetest of loves and you will feel a conviction not a condemnation that will guide you back to a path of righteousness I was messed up, amen, and he said he sent his word. This is Psalm 107. I never do this if I don't like numbers. Psalm 107, 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Delivered them from their destructions. Not my destructions, not my ill will for them. Not, he always meant good. It really blew my mind at the minute that I encountered the Lord and he said, James, this is real and I love you and spoke to a lie that I received as a little kid that I was a mistake in a church. It melted me and I saw this little kid, just this little broken, hurt, confused kid and it was me, my little weird Afro puff. My mom used to let me go out of the house in. <laughs> and I had this little projector screen and I had this big angry monkey projecting out of it and Jesus just took his heel and crushed it and picked me up and sat me on his lap. And Jesus knows I'm still a big old dummy, amen? He created me, <laughs> praise God. And he knew every time I hit that needle, he was there. Every time I smoked that drug, he was there. Every time I was in wrong relationship, he was there. Every time they tried to murder me in the joint, he was there because I'm still here, amen? <laughs> and though I couldn't receive that at the time, he had a plan and a purpose in my life that far outweighed anything my small drug abused mind could imagine. Amen? He uses the crazy stuff of the world to confound the wise. People still look at me like, I have a psychologist look at me and be like, bro, you were in a meth induced psychosis for seven months. There's no reason you should formulate a whole sentence. Amen. Yeah, there is, Yahweh. Yahweh. And I'm not saying to go out and willfully sin against God in spite of yourself and just, you know what I mean? Don't tempt God, right? Just mean well for your life. Just know there's something better for your life because Jeff and Andrea told me time and 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 time, and time, and time. he sent his word because Jesus was living on the inside of this dude and all them dudes that kept coming to the mission and all them ladies that kept praying over me. He just kept sending it and sending it and sending it and sending it. And if for a moment you think, well, James, you encountered Jesus. I didn't hear no voice from God. Every time you've been to church, every time you read that Bible, and every time you've heard somebody pray, you heard the voice of God. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You encounter Jesus every day. Amen. Every time you walk out your front porch and you see one of them trees blooming or dying, you see the promises of God for everything. There is a season. And what are you going to do in this season? Because I'll tell you this, and it would be an injustice to you if I didn't. You're going to die. This life is but a vapor. And do you really want it to be the sum of days sitting around wishing what you had or the sum of days going out there and trying everything you can to go get it? And I'm not talking about anything and everything. Amen. I'm talking about pursuing righteousness. Do you want that to be your record? Or do you want, like, well, I just wish God would have gave me better parents and, like, my flat tire happened, so it just ruined my whole day. That doesn't sound like a person with the king of all glory and eternal God sitting on the throne of their life. And I'm not saying you just, you find Jesus and all of a sudden, what? It doesn't work that way. It took me 36 years to become completely and totally jacked up. 
it might take me some time for Jesus to raise me up. But the same decision I have every moment of every day is the same one that I will have every moment of every day for the rest of my life until he takes me wherever I'm going. Amen. Praise God. We're going to go to heaven. But I have the opportunity right now in this moment, why this moment is so important, is I can say right now, I choose you. And right now in this moment, I can say, I choose you. And if I don't know what choosing him looks like, thank God for the body of Christ. (laughs) Where I'm trying to do the right thing, I don't know how, Cam. Amen. (laughs) And then letting somebody say, well, it don't look like that crap you're doing right now. (laughs) Well, who are you to tell me? You asked me for my help, bro. Where are we at? (laughs) How many times has that ever happened to you? Yeah, praise God. James, bro, I don't know how to figure it out. What, bro? I don't know how to read my Bible. You just take the front cover and flip it open. <laughs> you just read, man. But I don't know how to read the Bible. What do you mean? Where do I start? Anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. Amen. Just start anywhere. Because as long as you start... <laughs> He who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to an end. The author and finisher of our faith. Who's writing your story? I'll be honest with you, 75% of my day is written by the devil himself. Because if it's about me, it's not about even me, it's about the devil. It's about the devil keeping me in a blind, broken situation where I can't see the goodness of God and I won't want to return to it and I'll think that my reality is all there is. Well, what's real? I love Christian classes because they ask you about what reality is. I made my professor mad. I said, Jesus is the only reality. He is the logos from heaven. This thing that we move around in is not our reality. That thing took a south turn when Adam and Eve got chucked out of the garden. Amen? But Jesus came to return us to the garden. You guys get excited about this stuff? Or are you worthy? Are you waiting for something good to happen in your life? Well, why can't God didn't he did? Why don't you just be happy with breathing bread? It's his breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. The Bible says if we praise God, he inhabits our praise. Like he literally rides our praise. Amen. So guess what's happening when you're not praising God and you're doing all that complaining, you're having a satanic worship service. I lost my Harley keys. I bought a Harley breakout. It was really cool. I was excited. I took a ride. It's freezing out. It's February, and I lost my keys. <laughs> yeah. Called the Harley dealer, found out the, the number, and I was bummed out. I was like, man, this sucks. And I'm a super positive guy, so people hate that. Serious. If you're happy-go-lucky, people hate that stuff because they, they're miserable, and they don't understand why you're so happy in the midst of all this negative crap. Right? So people at the mission that you try to help like to be smart Alex. <laughs> and my buddy Shane, he walked up and slapped me in the back. He said, heck, man, at least you got hardly problems. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, even though what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. And I said, you know what? I got a Harley, God. Good Lord. I said, I remember the days I was sitting behind a dumpster like this, shooting water in my vein trying to trick my brain into thinking I was getting a fix so I could stop shivering and shaking like an idiot. I remember days picking scabs in a mirror for 45 minutes straight, blood running down my arms in my face, same outfit on for 17 days, whole world around me hated me, every voice in my head hated me, just wishing there was a better way, knowing it would never happen. And then I found myself in a place where I lost a set of Harley keys. And I said, but God, I'm not saying God's going to buy all of you guys a Harley. It's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying a no way story, son. Anybody you talk to that knew me, hey, James is all right if you stay on his good side, but it's, there ain't no way, son. <laughs> He'll probably die. I can't believe he ain't dead yet. Yeah. I was in prison. I contracted Crohn's disease. I didn't contract it. It's a genetic thing. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. I started to manifest Crohn's disease, right? Started bleeding really bad out of my rear end and 
going to the infirmary, and I was healthy. Like when I was in prison, I was real healthy. All I did was squats, lunges, push-ups, pull-ups. I mean, I was, I was a big dude. I was about 275 pounds, that angry, aggressive health freak. I didn't smoke cigarettes. I didn't do drugs. I was going to college. I was working two prison jobs in the joint. I was, and I was doing a whole lot of dirt behind the scenes. And I started going to the infirmary, telling them, started getting worse and worse, worse and worse, worse and worse. I went from like 275 pounds down to 180 in like 90 days. Pain got so bad, I just stopped getting out of my bunk. I had this sharp pain go down my right leg, blood clot. They put me on blood thinners. Three days later, I bled out. Wound up in Wishard Hospital with a hemoglobin level of one. So even in the midst of me really trying to do my best and really excel on my own to be my own hero, I was really killing it in the game. I had a lot of respect, and I just was doing awesome. And all of a sudden, downward spiral. I was in a hospital, chained to a hospital bed, legs swollen, clot in a filter, saying you'll never walk again, you may not lose your colon, all this stuff. And what I'm trying to say is that no matter how you do good on your own or what you do on your own, stop doing it on your own and do it with God because yeah. he's calling your name. He spared my life and I still went back to a life of hedonism because the devil likes to slide in and I don't care how holy you think you are, how many church services you've been to or prayer meetings, the devil's angling on you and I'm not giving that dude any power because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world but you ought to be sure that he who is in you is really living in there. Fear and trembling before the Lord and I'm guilty of not doing it myself the three days without the Bible, Amen. I just want to be real with you. Like, this is not easy. This is like war every day. Yeah. Because unfortunately for us, we've tasted like some wrong stuff. We found comfort in some wrong stuff. We didn't deal with life in a mature, appropriate, spiritual manner. Amen. It was too much about us. So guess what happens in that? We're real apt to do that thing. And as a community in this room, we ought to just say, okay, I get that. Because when you tell some church folks that who've been in church their whole life, they don't want to believe it because they're together. We know we're not together. Amen? Amen? The only thing that will put us together and keep us together is Jesus Christ. I hope you understand, like, this life is short. It's but a vapor. And I know that it seems long and arduous at some times, but what? thing is better like did you feel this moment going on in here just worshiping God man I mean it was just going down as soon as I come through the door bro back there I was like yeah you know, like I try to follow the rules right and this is real funny like you guys are like this I really try to follow the rules of my life because I didn't for a long time I really try to follow them. I sat down in that bathroom back there and it said don't put anything in the toilet except for toilet paper and I was like So I was like, Lord, uh, can, I, can I take some liberties, Lord? Is that allowable at this moment? Amen. So praise God, me and the Lord worked it out. And then when I come in this room, when I come in this room, I just felt the presence of the Holy Ghost because the name of God was being lifted up. And it was being lifted up honestly by some people that I believe really came here to seek something better. And what's been going on in your life, amen, and it's available. I could glory story you to death. God's done so many cool things in my life, man, but it's, it's like God did them. I didn't do any of them, so it's just God's glory, amen. He took a homeless wretch who wasn't sane, who was totally corrupt, wicked, hate-filled, and aggressive, and only nice to the people that he was nice to and still apt to do you bad. Ask Andrea and Jeff, amen. Praise God, they were like closer to me than like family, for real. Like Jeff was there, he was my homie. Andrea was there, she was my homie, bro, and I still did them bad. He took all that mess and he said, listen, if you're willing, I've always been here with you. I've always cared for you and I still do and I'll continue to because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So if you're ready, just come on. Karen told me Blake asked who the pastor was and I looked at the ceiling after a bunch of men of God had spoke that into my life and I shut him down. I'm not talking about just regular dudes, right? I'm talking about people that are hitting a crack pop like, man, you all have your own church. <laughs> I'm talking about dudes with PhDs and running churches for most of their life. I was telling them all, no, 
I looked at the ceiling tile and I, I said, Lord, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. <laughs> and I'll do my best to follow you. Amen. So he put me in school, which is an arduous task. That's really awesome because I'm, I mean, I got a GED because I had to. I was incarcerated. Amen. He gives me opportunities like this to just share about the goodness of God because I was a heathenous wretch, corrupt beyond all belief. And I'm still a major jerk, but I love Jesus and I try to do the right thing more often than I don't. I care about people. I don't have any ill will for anybody in this room. I didn't come here to gas you up, tell you lies or weird you out unless you're weirded out about Jesus. And that's all right. There's a place for that. Jeff used to tell me about Jesus and I'd get real mad at him. And he had a gun so I didn't get too mad at him. <laughs> But after I met the Lord, I realized it wasn't even me that was mad at Jeff. It was all the stuff that had me in bondage, not willing to let go, that was mad at Jeff. Because that wasn't the real me talking to Jeff. That was the junkie in me trying to hang on to a drug-addicted lifestyle full of excuses why I should be on drugs, full of all this stuff that happened to me in my past. And it was just denial of who God said I was. Man, I created you. You're my son. And you're free to come back to the kingdom anytime you want. And you're also free to never come back if you don't want to. That's why it says in the Bible, Jesus will either say, well done, or I never knew you. It was our choice. Well, why would God send anybody to hell? He didn't send them there. They chose this. Now it ain't God's fault. It's our fault. So all that stuff with excuses and crappy complaints against God and poor me and all that stuff you can just chuck at and just say, I thank you, God, that you gave me breath in my lungs. I thank you that you thought of me before you ever spoke any of this into existence because all the people you didn't think about, nobody knows because you didn't think about them. But I can be known and I can be seen for the real me because you thought of me for your glory, that I would lift your name, that I would testify to my wrongs and the goodness of God and you spared me in spite of and gave me a heart to truly follow you. And it ain't churched up and it ain't weird, but I've rode around the bottom for long enough and then I came up far enough to see some real together people and they don't look real happy, but I also met some people that really love Jesus, that have a hope, a peace, a patience, and a kindness and an everlasting faith favor that it seems is real attractive to me and I'd like to grab a hold of it while I yet can. Amen. Amen. And I hope you do too. We can't do it on our own. You have to have Jesus and you have to have the body of believers. So instead of looking at people saying, yeah, right, or what do you know, or how are you going to tell me, won't you just say, okay, because I was a rebellious jerk who would never do anything anybody asked me to. And I promise you the day I shut that thing off and said, okay, I'll just do it. It's weird. I don't like it. I don't want to. It's called humility. It's called being humble. Amen. And I just started doing what people asked me to do in my life. has got increasingly better day by day because it graduated into an understanding that if I could listen to you tell me something and it worked out real good, why couldn't I listen to the Holy Spirit tell me something? How long have I been up here? Too long? Is this good stuff? It's just Jesus. I'm just a dude. Amen. <laughs> I got to perform a wake for a young lady that went through the rescue mission. I worked there, and I didn't get to meet her on any sort of real level, um, and I don't have time to unpack that, but a lot of people give you a face and not a, a truth. Amen. Amen? They'll give you a face and not a truth, so I believe I met her face a few times, but not her truth. And uh, she wound up dying, didn't have anybody to really do the service, I guess. Well, I think people were just caught in a panic of the hurt for, felt thing, so they just thought of me, praise God, because they know I lift the name of God high, so they just called James so I got to do this wake and I just told him I said you know I'm not here to judge this young lady and I know that most of you in the, in the crowd are probably scared to death she's in hell or her lifestyle sucks so bad but I said here's the deal I said while we yet have each other while we're all breathing air and we can see taste touch feel and smell why don't we just love each other instead of being mean to one another why don't we just help somebody instead of hating somebody? Why don't we just lift somebody up? You know what I mean? He said, because if you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. <coughs> but we got enough to learn to look at people. I can't believe they wore that, said that, did that. Why can't you believe it? We live in a world, a sin-fallen world, full of chaos and iniquity. 
Of course, we're going to manifest some weird stuff every now and then. What we need is people to manifest Jesus and be like, listen, that was weird, but I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's people out there like that. That guy. That guy. Jeff, you know how many times Jeff has looked at me and be like, you're a strange dude, but I love you, buddy. <laughs> I'll give you a, a, a practice in patience that Jeff showed me, right? I was a heathen, is what I'm trying to tell you, and I'm not glorifying that. But Jeff was always telling me about Jesus, and Jeff is always going to be one of those people in my mind that I can never say wavered from the goodness of God because he was always patient, kind, understanding, and willing to receive me back to love on me again. And I did him bad. I was running from the police. They used to live, I can't remember what street it is, but they used to live down the road from the stop. Light, and I had about 15 grams of heroin and about 5 grams of crystal meth in my pocket. Cops knew who I was. They knew the vehicle I was driving, knew I had a tail light out. I'd cause all kinds of light chaos in Huntington enough to be on their radar. Amen. I hit this stoplight, hit a left turn signal. It didn't come on because it was busted. Amen. And I seen this dude pull a jack move right out of the alley. He was watching me down onto the road, and I went in doubt, throttle out. <laughs> Whipped it left. <laughs> And this little Jeep Liberty, amen. And I didn't even get this thing in a full park, dude. I hit the e-brake and I jumped out and I tripped and fell down, jumped up, ran and kicked Andrea and Jeff's door in. Boom! Shut it behind me, ran back to the bathroom. It was like, oh, God. Oh, God. Because I know that cop see me go in there. I'm like, oh, they're surrounding the house. I was freaked out, tweaked out, you know what I mean, and trying to die. So I'm doing a bunch of dope sitting on Jeff and Andrea's toilet thinking the police are surrounding the house. And I'm like, this is it. I'm going to die. And I was like, oh. I remember thinking, oh, my God, they're going to find me dead on their toilet. And, like, they're really nice to me. <laughs> this is really going to hurt their feelings. Like, they're going to be screwed up about this. And I heard the door open, and I was like, oh, it's going down, and I ain't dead, so I'm going to prison, right? I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh. And Andrea opens the bathroom door and goes, ah! <laughs> She goes, what are you doing in here? And I was like, I'm hiding. She was like, get out. <laughs> you remember that? Bro, you meet a church person anywhere and kick in their door and you are trying to get high to death on their toilet. <laughs> You're going to prison and rightfully you should. <laughs> he just said, I love you, man. And Jesus loves you more than I ever will. I know you can't see it, but I pray for you, James. I pray that you walk in the goodness of what God has in store for your life. And I'd walk away and call him an idiot. God spoke to my life and changed the direction of it. And now people ask me about Jesus. I had a guy come down from a chapel one night in tears. And he said, how do you know Jesus is real? I said, I know because you just asked me that question. Because if you'd have met me six years ago, I'd have been the furthest person from your mind to ask that question. So when it doesn't look like it's going to get any better, don't give up. You keep praying. You keep showing up. You keep giving it everything you have. And you trust God for the rest. And whatever he decides to put in your path, you thank him and you glorify him for. Because you don't deserve none of it. He gave you your life as a gift that you might echo back his goodness. And the sooner you realize your idea of goodness and your perception of this world was built by evil, you got to have an Escalade and a 401k and your kids got to go to the finest school and all this stuff. You got to have the best friends and all that. And if I ain't got none of that, God ain't good. How many times have we done it? Stop doing it. Because his people lived in tents in the middle of a desert, son. <laughs> There was sand in between their toes. I usually say something else, but it's inappropriate. We're in the church house. Amen. Uh, but yeah, they weren't living on no silly posturpedic mattresses, waking up with little nail files. and uh, uh, What's that stuff? I don't know. Maybelline to paint on their toes and their mascara faces. You know what I mean? They was out, they was out in the desert talking about, it is hot out here, Lord. And he just, oh, you sit in the cloud. Well, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> 
Amen. We got air conditioners and escalates. We ought to say, hallelujah. Amen. We got medical help that'll save us from the stuff that kills other people. We got people who get it, who really believe Jesus, who are telling each other about it. We got people showing up in environments like this, pouring their guts out, telling you, please come home. And if you feel like you're home, good. Stay there because you can walk out of bounds. Amen. You can definitely leave the territory of the kingdom. You guys want a short history lesson? And I'll end with this. This is beautiful, though. He sent his word and healed them and saved them from their destructions, right? Jesus just calls us into a relationship with him. And he is the king of his domain. So everywhere his word goes and everywhere he is is what? His domain. It's his kingdom. I'm talking to you about the things inside your brain. Because the kingdom of God is in you. If you will let it. Because the sick are being healed. The dead are being raised. And people are being cleansed. Because people are letting the kingdom live inside them. If you had a wrong thought or did something, something bad to somebody, ask them for forgiveness. Rebuke the thought. Seek help in the Lord and the family of God of people you trust and say whatever to you. Find transparent weirdos like me who will tell you anything going on in their life and don't care about what you think about me. Because it ain't about me, it's about Jesus and a better understanding. So we can restore the earth. Well, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. Shame on you. What about all the people who don't know Jesus yet? <laughs> How many of them did you say before he came back? Praise God. And if he came back just to get you, that's real sad. Amen. Love somebody. Praise God. You got to say, oh yeah, question and answer time. Shoot me. For real, you can ask me anything. I'm not going to, uh, I'll tell you what my truth is. Praise God. It's not like I'm going to lose a check. They didn't pay me to show up. Praise God. <laughs> yeah. They they're, we're still waiting on that day. <laughs> One of them's too little, I think, really, to have a conception other than she just wants her daddy. The other two hate my guts. Yes and no. It's real weird. So, to, just full transparency, my youngest daughter lives in Huntington with her mom. And I was trying to have a relationship with her. Her mom was in jail. She was supposed to come stay with us overnight. It wasn't a big deal. I wasn't trying to kidnap her or nothing. I just wanted her to come spend the night, and I was going to bring her back. <laughs> like, I love her grandpa. Um, I, you know what I mean? I don't want no ill will for her mom. None of that. Like, I'm kosher. I love Jesus. So I was going to bring her back. But she called from the jail. I was like, I don't want her to stay there. And I got real mad feelings hurt about me so I was like screw that so I haven't really reached out since then my other two kids my son lived with me he tried to accost my wife I gave him the slap he rode off into the sunset called the cops they charged me with level six domestic battery so CPS took him placed him in a home he was like almost 18 um, he was working at McDonald's like he was doing okay right so they just let him transfer his job put him in a different school system he said he never wanted to talk to me again my middle daughter was raised by her mom and her stepdad, so she like never really came back close central to me. She just kind of stayed in the safe camp because she was familiar with that territory. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, girls are, you're a girl. You're weirdos, you know what I mean? <laughs> you expect us to figure out stuff we don't even know you're thinking because you won't talk to us first. Amen. Right? Amen. So, what, like... Moral of the story is, and I'm not being mean towards girls, but girls do that stuff, and men do it too. We're just not so bold to, to answer it, but I, don't, I can't read your mind. So unless you speak your truth and speak what's really going on and be vulnerable with people, they can't meet a need. I can't meet something I don't know exists, right? So it's not, it's not my kids' fault. It's my fault for being a strung-out douchebag my whole life and then kind of selfish now, amen? He's going to ask me something. Sounds like you've been a whole lot of Christian back for a long time, and after you um, got right with Jesus, did your cravings go away? Did you have any cravings after that, or no, none? 
So Jesus spoke to my life, and he said, James, this is real, and I love you. And he completely took the desire for drugs and alcohol out of my life, right? Did you pray for that? Did you pray for the desire to go away? It just went. It just went. And I, praise God, that's not everybody's story. What he didn't take was the lustful perversion, the codependency, the need for a female in my life, which led me down a path where I did hit a crystal meth pipe. But when I hit that thing, it was like the weight. I just, I can't explain to you the feeling, but it was like the weight of the world, like sat down on me, and there was this weird darkness. Like light didn't change, but there was just this, and I was like, I got to get out of here, and I did. I jumped up, and I was like, I got to go. I ran right back to the rescue mission, and I snitched on myself. I said, I was trying to have this wrong relationship with this girl. I wasn't even supposed to be down there doing what I was doing. They had a crystal meth pipe that passed around to me. I did what was natural, grabbed a lighter, went to hit it, and I said, it freaked me out. I'm snitching on myself. Like, do what you want to do to me, but I want to get better, and I don't want that. So whatever happens and comes behind that, freely do it. So they sanctioned me, um, cut two months out of my time which means held me back in the program. Um, wouldn't let me leave for a, a while, praise God. But I haven't done drugs and alcohol since. So listen, don't get, don't get weirded out. If like you still have a craving, that's normal. Cigarettes, like right now I smoke, right? I just came off a spree of four and a half months not smoking. Funny story, I overdosed on Chantix, trying to take a different medication that I really belonged on. And I did, it was generic Chantix, so it didn't say Chantix, it said whatever generic Chantix is. And I looked at her, she's a nurse, I said, oh my gosh. I said, what is this? And she was like, what'd you say? And I was like, she's like, it's Chantix, you weirdo, why? And I was like, well, I just took six of them. And she, I was like, am I gonna die? She was like, no, you're probably gonna feel real weird for a few days. And I did. But I didn't smoke, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is why people aren't vulnerable, amen? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I didn't smoke for four and a half months, and then me and her got into it, and my pride and myself was just welled up in me, and I was angry. And all that is is a catalyst to do the wrong thing, so then I smoked, went and bought a pack of cigarettes. I'll show you, I'll give myself cancer. <laughs> Yeah, you feel bad now? Huh? <laughs> so I'm back in a spree of trying to kick that thing, amen? Yeah. Uh, three years, six months, 22 days, one hour, 45 minutes, and 45 seconds. So a sober counter counter that for me. and. and it, and I'll be honest with you, I think it's the weirdest thing ever. It's like, I, don't, I didn't get sober to just be sober, so a lot of people get sober and they hold their sobriety like this little baby, and their sobriety becomes their God. I believe, so I believe in recovering. I believe in recovery, which means you eventually recover. Now listen, I'm not saying we should negate all the positive attitudes, mentalities, postures, disciplines, uh, commitments that we committed to during our recovery in order to maintain recovered. Because it's always our choice. A lot of people are like, it's a disease and we can, don't start throwing stuff at me. But you chose to begin. And whether you like it or not, no matter how bad the pull was, no matter how bad the feeling was, no matter how bad you justified the circumstances around you, you still chose to continue to do it. Just like I still choose to light that cigarette. Is it a sickness? Yeah, science can call it a sickness and they can pay you for it and uh, the government can back that thing. And well, well, no, but they want you to be helpless because they don't want you to be more than an overcomer. How many of you know some people that have conquered some stuff? Amen. Praise God. And the only person that I know who conquered it all was Jesus. Amen. Now, are there people out there that do way less harm to their self than I do by smoking cigarettes and not cussing every now and then and dealing with their anger better? Yes. Are they more Christian than me? I don't even know what to do with that, and I don't even have an answer for that statement because we can't judge the mind of another person or the heart of a person. Only God can.
It's our responsibility to show up like my wife does, and every time I click that lighter, say, hey, you smoking, or what are you doing? And I look at her like, you know what I'm doing. She's like, I know. I know what you're doing, you weirdo. I'm calling you out. <laughs> That's what you need. But she ain't left me. She ain't treated me bad. She hasn't talked smack to me. She hasn't given up. She hasn't walked out. She hasn't abandoned me. She just says, I know you're better, and there's a promise over your life, and you could walk in so much greater things if you just let this go. And that's what we ought to do for each other. I ain't got a question, but I just want to say that it's time to stop the regrets and be there for the same people, to know the same people, to see where we're at today. Just those little things from the Spirit that God is talking about us. Thanks, man. I love you, John. I just see one more guy. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, it's cool. Jesus is cool, right? I mean that, and it's not, like I said, people are always like, I'm proud of you, and I get that, I receive that, so don't think I'm negating it. I'm not being false, weird, or churchy. Jesus Christ. <coughs> yeah, and you just heard me testify to letting that thing fall by the wayside, letting things get in the way, letting my anger monkey well up, and making wrong choices. Praise God. So just as much as we can latch on to it and get into the good graces of Jesus, we can walk right back out of them. And it's easy to do. How many of you know you can do bad all by yourself? Amen. Praise God. How many of you know it's easier to do bad sometimes than the right thing? How, many, how easy is it to go up to somebody and admit you completely don't know what you're doing? That's the funny thing about God is like in the position that he put me in at Iwu. I can't ever say I know anything about that job. I don't. The only thing I can do is be humble and ask for help every day. And it's God saying, son, this is what I need you to do with me every day because you're starting to forget. I just need you to be humble and ask how to live, how to breathe, how to move. Because we all want to be like, well, I did this thing. I did this thing. I saved this person. I prayed this thing. I started this Bible study. I ran this meeting. I did, I did this thing. Did Jesus tell you to do it? Because if he didn't, it means nothing. And the only way it will mean something is if you mention the word of God, which does the work itself. And we ought to be blessed by it because we don't deserve it. And it's only him doing the work and he allows us to be a conduit for his grace. That's reality, man. Anybody that's like, don't let church and all that stuff get weird. There ain't no perfect people. There's only us and people in a sin-fallen world who desperately need Jesus each and every day. Who ought to help each other get a little closer. Who ought to love each other through the sickness, through the mess, through the, the chaos. I'm not saying you enable and validate people. It's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. You just keep loving them. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thank you for keeping on loving me, brother. Yeah. It's real tough. I mean, there's a lot of people that can see it. You're going to see it on the backside. And I can testify to seeing you time and time again just loving on me. And uh, next month I'll have a year, but. Let's go. Awesome. You know it. <laughs> Let's go. That's Jesus, man. If he, if Jesus didn't change my life, ask Andrew and Jeff that you. I never been talking to none of y'all unless you had dope. I'm serious. If Jesus wouldn't change my life, I wouldn't be sitting right here talking about Jesus. Ask Andrew and Jeff. I mean, like when I tell you I was close to these two, I mean I was like every day, six, seven hours. Like I used to hang out with this little girl, jump on a trampoline with her, take her places, buy her soda. She used to pull my little girl around in a little stroller, sling her on her hip. Like Elsie was half the size of Ava, and Ava's running around with Elsie on her hip. And I thought that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. But I ain't carrying her, so whatever. Amen. I'm serious, like family, man. And I was a wretch. They still loved on me. They still picked me up. They still hooked me up, not with dope, but they just hooked me up with, like, love, food, time, an escape route before stuff got worse sometimes. <laughs> oh, believe me, bro, I used to be a violent, aggressive weirdo, and I used to do wrong stuff, and they probably saved some, a couple people from, and me from some bad situations just because they let me sit on the couch for way too long. Amen? Just love somebody, man. Like, do you, I'll, I'll end with this. I know I said that earlier. I'm a preacher. That's what we do. Do you really, 
want to go, th go through your life and your days and not, not love somebody, not help somebody, and think that you got it together and I'll, if they just were like you, or if they would just get it together, or if they just love Jesus like you love Jesus, well, won't you show them how you love Jesus? By loving them. Because all this having stuff, doing stuff, all this Americanized weird stuff we get into means nothing in God's eyes. It's all his stuff. And we manipulate it, abuse it, and abuse each other with it and use it to posture and position and say, I'm better than. Just let it go and love somebody. If they smell like two tons of turkey crap and 14 <laughs> packs of cigarettes and you know they ain't worked a job ever in their life and they've just been shooting dope, just go love on them. Go buy them a sandwich and hang out with them. Just tell them their value. Like somebody told me mine. Praise God. Sit back down. I love you, bro. Like even Krista was like in the in the circle because of her and Andrea being so close. I went to the Dream Center one time, right? This is a funny story. I, I'll never forget this a day in my life. It's so funny because Krista, like I know Krista, right? She's cool. We're friends. We're buddies. <laughs> That's it. And uh, she seen me. I was moving furniture across the road at the Dream Center, and there was a, like four or five dudes with me. And she was like, James, bro, I'm so proud of you, bro. Like, you're getting your life together. Praise God. Like, cool stuff. And she gave me a big hug. She walked away, and they were all like, jaw on the floor. They're like, you know her? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> you weirdos. Like, man, creepy weirdos. <laughs> Just I'm close. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, I'm close to these people. They know me, and like when he said it's a blessing for him and his family, like that blesses my heart because I know what I put them through. <laughs> I know how undeserving I was of this guy's favor because if I was him, I'd have probably shot me straight up. You almost, you almost did. Yeah. Well, I wasn't going to bring it up. I didn't want to besmirch your character, you know what I mean? <laughs> now, look, now look, when you, when you walk in my house at 2.30 in the afternoon, I'm coming up the stairs going, Hey, Mother River! And I'm just waking up now. I'm a combat vet. So the first thing I'm thinking is like, I'm going to have to shoot somebody. It's all right, and man. I was in my pajamas when he opened the door. So I don't wear pajamas. Hey, you know what another cool thing is about Jesus is that I literally gave up all my pride, all my ego, every possession, everything I could ever do, every relationship in the pursuit of one thing, a fix. So when I encountered the Lord... He said, listen, Junior, I don't want you to do anything that drastically different. I just want you to point your heart in a different direction and be willing to give up all that stuff for just one thing, the only thing that matters. Do I toe that line all the time? No. Am I being flippant and weird about that? No. I ought to do my best to toe that line, and sometimes I don't. And sometimes try as I might, I can't. But thank God for the body of Christ and people like Cam and this lady and Trav and Jeff and Andrea and my wife and like your pastors who will just be like, look, bro, like, because what the devil wants you to do is screw up once. Now you didn't make it. Now it's over. That's not Jesus. Amen. Jesus is like, I'm here. I know you're going to screw up. Just try not to. Trust me, seek me, honor me, love me, search me, seek me. And when you don't come back, just come back, just come back, just come back. Because you don't want to be going the other direction when you draw your last breath. You know, I, I know James has said a few times, like, what me and Andrea have done or what you guys have done and what you've done as his wife and whatever, but... Um, that yeah, time girl. when he was coming in on my front porch, he yeah, his wife, her, her lady. I love her. <laughs> he loves you. He, uh, when James was coming in my life, I was, I was a mess. Um, I was anxiety ridden 24 hours a day. Like I was, I was, I was jacked up. Like I was, I was really going through some stuff. And um, my wife took me in, knowing I was a mess. Like I just came off. Got a wheelchair when we first met him. Like, why does she want me? I'm a bum. I don't have a job. A mess too. <laughs> I don't have a job. I don't have a bank account. 
<laughs> and uh, she let me into her life, and you know, she started to tell me who I was, you know, like affirmation. And when you came around, I'm like, man, I see something in this guy. And God's gifted me with that to like see things in people. And I'm like, man, you, you deserve more. You deserve so much more. Why are why do you why do you bring yourself down? Oh man, you're gonna get in this Jesus stuff again, aren't you? And this dude's smart. Like I don't know where he came up with it. I mean, but he he would come up with some crazy theology and everything to fight against and oppose. Like he had opposition against everything I brought at him, and he was good. But something that 